Hi everyone and welcome into the second episode of Plead Your Case for the spring 2023 semester here at Waynesburg on WCTV. I'm your host, Austin Bechtold. Today I'll be joined by Spencer Frateri and Ron Brown to discuss the AFC and NFC Championship games and the two teams punching their ticket to Super Bowl 57. We'll also go in detail on the 2023 Pro Bowl with a flag football game, the new replacement for the regular AFC and NFC style game coached by the Manning brothers, as well as skills competitions, adding a new development to the Pro Bowl. We'll also go in detail on March Madness coming up and the state of college basketball heading into February with conference tournaments only a month away. So sit back and relax because it is time to plead your case. The Philadelphia Eagles and Kansas City Chiefs are on their way to Super Bowl 57 in Phoenix, Arizona. Spencer, the Eagles outright dominated against the San Francisco 49ers due in large part of Brock Purdy's injury, a torn UCL, an injury that will keep him out for at least six months, an injury that caused baseball pictures about 14 months of recovery time. San Francisco had to go to fourth quarterback Josh Johnson to be able to try it to mount a comeback against Philadelphia and head to the Super Bowl. But it was just not meant to be for San Francisco. It's Philadelphia on both sides of the ball, and especially in the trenches, dominated. Yeah. I completely agree. And I almost want to say that I, don't, I think even with Purdy in this, in this game, it, this is a similar outcome. Um, the run game for the Eagles was just on point. And this, again, remember, is against arguably one of the best run defenses in the NFL today. And you have guys like Gamewell going for 48 yards, Miles Sanders, 42 yards, two touchdowns. Boston Scott even got a touchdown. Jalen Hurts went in there. No receiver scored a touchdown. It was all the run game. A.J. Brown had 28 receivers receiving yards. Devonta Smith had around 30 receiving yards. I mean, the story of the game was the dominant run game from the Philadelphia Eagles. And Ron, Jalen Hurts only had about 150 yards passing. If I would have told you he'd have 150 passing yards, no touchdowns, do you think Philadelphia would win the game? No. To be honest with you, I wouldn't have said that because, I mean, Jalen Hurts has, been, has played tremendous. I think if he wasn't injured this year, he would have definitely been the most valuable player in the uh, NFL this year. But um, I think defensively is what they should be the real MVPs for the Eagles because they, you know, they had three sacks, five TFLs, seven quarterbacks hit, and the 49ers only had 261 yards total offense. And as far as you saying that, you know, if Brock Purdy plays, it's totally different. I mean, it's the same thing. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't agree with that because I think Brock Purdy played really well these last, what was it, five? Brock Purdy six? was undefeated as a starter. Yeah, so, I mean, how can you say it was really going to be the same type of game with him playing? And plus, you're playing with somebody like Josh Johnson, who's, that man's been around forever. He's been a league journeyman. He's played, every year he's been in the league, he's played for a different team. And he even went for a stint in the XFL. You know, a guy like that, you're not going to win too many games. He's a career backup, and that's just – I think if Purdy plays healthy, it's a totally different game. I Do I think they win? I'm not going to go as far to say that, but I will say it, it would have been a different game. It was Johnson's fourth stint with the 49ers overall in his entire career, and I think you got to give Brock Purdy credit. He came back into the game. You could tell visibly on the sideline he said, I can't throw – just the numbness in his fingers and just overall the injury that he sustained, in no way can he throw the football with that. And for him to be able to come back, play, and still just be able to tough it out, people were giving a ton of credit to Patrick Mahomes with a high ankle sprain. you got to give credit to Purdy and just give him his due. Yeah, I completely agree, but I, I'm, I, I just have to disagree with Ron. I just think that the Eagles defense, like we said, I think everyone's talked about it all year, this 49ers defense – Probably the best defense in the NFL, I think, is a pretty good argument. But I just think that everyone overlooked that Eagles defense. Um, they were overrated all year. They had to play an easy schedule. Well, now they're in the, the playoff run. Now they're in the Super Bowl. They've made it to the Super Bowl, but they're beating the Giants. I know the Giants weren't anything too special, but they were on a hot streak. The right, Eagles so do you think that shut that down. beating the Giants 38-7 to and now beating the 49ers 31-7, to do you think this is the easiest road to the Super Bowl that a team has had in recent memory? No, I, I don't. I mean, I think, yes, the regular season they had 
not a hard schedule, but it wasn't, I mean, no schedule in the NFL is really easy. You're playing against guys who do this for a living, but you go against a Giants team who everyone claimed was hot, and the Eagles came in there and dominated, and then now going you know, against the last game against the 49ers, they do the same thing, and they go in and just completely dominate the run game against this great uh, run defensive team. So I just, they're on, I like to think the Eagles are on a hot streak now, and I mean, it's going to take a lot to stop them here if you're Pat Mahomes and the Chiefs. Yeah, Ron, the Eagles are definitely on a hot streak, but when you look at the fact that the, the Giants overall were a team that was definitely overachieving, some people thought would win five games, Brian Dable turns Daniel Jones into a playoff quarterback, and it all goes stall, stalling out in the playoffs. But Brock Purdy also getting hurt on the first drive. San Francisco really had a, never had a chance offensively. Do you think that that maybe is part of the argument is Philadelphia having an easy road in the playoffs, not substantially in the regular season, with the NFCs being one of the best divisions in football, if not the best this season? Do you think the playoff road, though, was one of the easiest? Well, yeah, I was about to say, you know, you can't really say it's a soft schedule, you know, having two other teams in their division go on to advance to the playoffs and have another team that was on the, was teetering, was about to make the playoffs. You can't really say they had a soft schedule, but I mean, everybody is professionals at the end of the day. Everybody's still going out. They're still going to collect their paycheck every Tuesday. So they're playing for something. This is how they feed their family. So it's not like a high school team, you know, going to play a bad high school team versus a good high school team. It's, you know, everybody's professionals. So as far as that, I think, you know, the Giants were, they did overachieve. All the New York teams, except the, except the Bills, overachieve. But I think the Giants did overachieve. But I think they still, they were a tough team to play. Um, and then the 49ers losing somebody like their starting quarterback. Well, yeah, their starting quarterback in the first drive of the game, that, messes, that messed up their whole momentum. And then also letting the Eagles go down and score the first play, first drive of the game, that also, I think, messed up their momentum. And I think, you know, like I said, it's, it's a different story if Purdy plays. You know, he had that team on his back the last seven weeks it was. And he, and that's something special coming in as a mystery relevant and just taking your team going undefeated and not like he was it's not like he was throwing for just like game manager numbers right. he was out there winning games mr relevant became relevant but the game itself definitely was not but the game that did live up to the hype was the afc championship game 23 to 20. the kansas city chiefs five straight afc championships all at home this time defeating the cincinnati Bengals, getting revenge from last season spencer as Kansas City and Patrick Mahomes make it three Super Bowls in the past four years. Well, it's a classic game, and it was a classic case of karma. Um, you know, Cincinnati goes in, and they win their two playoff games, their one, excuse me, and then all this trash talk forms. You have them saying all these things, Burrowhead, all this. You have the mayor of Cincinnati weighing in, and you don't really see much comments from the Chiefs side of things. There was almost no Twitter, no Instagram, no social media from the Chiefs side of things. They kept quiet before, all before the game. And then they come in, you come into Arrowhead. It's not Burrowhead, it's Arrowhead. The Bengals come in and it's not a blowout, but they do end up losing. And it's just, it's Patrick Mahomes. It was the battle of the quarterbacks, Patty Mahomes, 29 for 43, 326 passing yards with two TDs, no interceptions. So I think Patrick Mahomes came in, he heard it all week. He heard all the trash talk and said, this is Arrowhead, this is my house. I'm gonna show you what I can do. How much of a motivational factor do you think that was? Because clearly post game, Travis Kelsey and, and Patrick Mahomes made it known that they were really taken back by the comments. And it's huge. I mean, you, you have the Cincinnati Bengals, like I mentioned, they beat the Bills, and then you have Eli Apple, Trash Talk, you Stephon Diggs. Cancun Allen, on three. Yeah, Cancun, all this junk. And now you're going against a team who is starting to look like the Patriots with Tom Brady on them, with Patty Mahomes, you have Kelsey. The run game, it wasn't there against the Bengals, but, I mean, this is a Chiefs team that we know is very, very dominant, and you're just trash talking all this, and it's all building up, and then you get to game time, and it's who really will show out, who will play well, and at the end of the day, it was the Chiefs. Two interceptions thrown by Joe Burrow. Patrick Mahomes, once again, was able to take care of the football create a drive late in the game to be able to win it. Got help from a 15-yard penalty as well. That was really, Joseph aside, the backbone of Cincinnati has been defense and Joe Burrow carrying the way with Jamar Chase. And unfortunately for the Bengals, a late penalty cost them, but it wasn't the only thing, Ron, that really played a factor in terms of the officials over the weekend. Yeah, I mean, as far as the officials, I mean, that's why you can't really leave it in the refs' hands. I mean, there's a, uh, 
there's a reason why you got to still go out there and play the game. I think they both came to play. Both teams came to play. It was a it was a hard fought game. And you know, as far as like the trash talk, like you were saying, that's why you have to go out there and prove it. You know, you giving these guys all week saying Burrowhead, giving these guys like the Chiefs. Um, locker room material to put up on the wall. It's like, yeah, this is the reason why we're going to go out there and we're going to smack you guys in the mouth. And you're not just going to walk in here like you did last year. And especially, I think that's another thing, them losing to them last year gave them motivation to beat them this year. And, you know, seeing a guy like Mahomes, uh, I think he's a, he's a great player. He's arguably the best quarterback in today's game. And seeing him go out there on one leg with a high ankle sprain and scramble for that, that first down when they needed it and getting them in field goal range, he proved why he's one of the top guys in the game today. And it is going to be the first Super Bowl in NFL history with two African-American starting quarterbacks in the 57-year history of the Super Bowl. So Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts will not be playing in the Pro Bowl. Who will? Who is the new replacement quarterback just announced today on Tuesday? Find out next here on Plead Your Case. Cue the breaking news sounder. We have new information about the new head coach of the Denver Broncos. The Saints are trading the rights to Sean Payton to Denver for a first round pick in 2023 and also another pick likely to be a second rounder as well. So big changes in Denver as the offensive mastermind will go and work with Russell Wilson and try to fix one of the worst situations in football, the underachieving Denver Broncos. Now let's go to the Pro Bowl, which is underachieved in performance in a lot of people's minds. With Tyler Huntley of the Ravens, the backup quarterback to Lamar Jackson, who started the second half of the season for the Baltimore Ravens, making the Pro Bowl despite throwing for two touchdowns and three interceptions this season and mainly being a threat on the ground. Okay, Spencer, I think we all agree that Tyler Huntley should not be in the Pro Bowl. So, did Kenny Pickett decline the invite for the Steelers? Are you going to suggest Deshaun Watson? We could go through a list of names of quarterbacks that are in the AFC because there is no way that Tyler Huntley was one of the guys that was around the top of the alternate list. Now, Austin, while I would like to disagree and say Kenny Pickett shouldn't be in there, over Huntley, I think Kenny Pickett should 100% be in there. I'm not going to mention Watson as much as I'd love to. I want to focus on Jacoby Brissett. I think, I mean, over Huntley, easily, he led the Browns to a five or six win record while Deshaun Watson was out and really him, no one really expected him to do much. I mean, he was kind of just like go in there, win two or three games. You're in there till Watson gets in there. Once he's back, we'll see you later. And that was the case. As soon as Watson got back, you never really saw much else of Brissett. But I mean, he outperformed everyone, especially the Cleveland people. I mean, I know myself, I expected him to do absolutely nothing. And he comes in and he wins some crucial games and, I mean, we were close to a playoff run, not close. I mean, we no, we'll never make the playoffs. I mean, that's just how it is in Cleveland. But I just – I don't think Tyler Huntley – there are a ton of other QBs – other QBs, excuse me, that should be over Huntley like Kenny Pickett. All right, Ron. So, Patrick Mahomes is going to the Super Bowl. Joe Burrow is not going to participate in the Pro Bowl. Lamar Jackson's hurt. Tua Tagovailoa is still on concussion protocols. Justin Herbert just had surgery. Josh Allen is also hurt, okay? So you're looking at Derek Carr, who the Raiders benched for the final two games of the year. Sorry to our producer, Logan Lefiscopo, with that situation. And Trevor Lawrence, who led the resurgent Jacksonville Jaguars to the playoffs, won a critical game against the Chargers, 
and put up a fight in Kansas City as well. And then there's Tyler Huntley. So potential options, Ryan Tannehill, Mac Jones, some, one of the Cleveland quarterbacks, Kenny Pickett. I don't know because I would like to say Jacoby Brissett, just like how you said uh, Jacoby Brissett, but the problem is when he only played half the season and was taken out and replaced by Sean Watson, so it was hard for him to go in. Kenny Pickett, I think, was more deserving than those guys were because, I mean, he played better. And Tyler Huntley only played like five games, four Well, and games. think about the trajectory of the Ravens once Tyler Huntley became the quarterback. They won a couple of games. They were like tied for first place with Cincinnati in the division. And then Lamar goes down and Baltimore crumbles into a wild card position and really had no chance overall to be able to win the division. Did have a solid shot if Huntley did not fumble at the goal line, which was taken back for a touchdown by Sam Hubbard that was the clincher for Cincinnati in the wild card round. But overall, kind of surprising that Tyler Huntley ends up being the selection. But overall, the Pro Bowl is now a flag football game. Spencer, is this the right move for the Pro Bowl? The, the Pro Bowl, out of all four core North American major sports, is definitely the worst. Yeah, I completely agree. But I will say, I am a huge fan of this flag football thing. We have not seen it yet, so we don't know how it's going to go. But let me tell you, I am a huge fan. You got uh, there's uh, Flag football around the world today is so huge. It really gets the kids going. Youth-wise, you have parents who don't want their kids getting tackled. You send them to flag football. Flag football is not a degradation. I mean, people love playing flag football. I think it's going to be great, and I think these athletes are excited to you know, go in. None of them really tried in this anyways in previous years. They don't want to get injured, and that's all explainable. Now you get to still have the same competitive advantage, or not advantage, the same competitive stance, pros going against pros, but now instead of having to worry about tackles, you have flag football. I think guys are really going to get into this more, and I think this is going to be a lot more fun to watch than in previous years. So Peyton Manning will coach the AFC. Eli Manning will coach the NFC. Ron, you're a football player. What do you think of this overall change where it basically the Pro Bowl turned into a bunch of guys not wanting to tackle each other, risk getting injured, we'll come collect our paycheck and walk out the door? Yeah, I haven't been a fan of the Pro Bowl since I was a little kid. And, you know, once I started getting older, I wasn't a big fan of it at all. Because you see it basically, you see a lot of guys trying to avoid each other and not trying to get each other injured. So it's basically just became like basically go throw the ball and run around and take a knee, basically. I'd rather see something where, like the flag football game where, okay, you can see, you know, these athletes and, you know, having these superior athletes, this would be an entertaining flag football game. And having somebody, a great legend like Peyton Manning and his brother Eli Manning become the coaches, that is going to be something great. I would like to see them, you know, have like the old school, like how they used to have the games where like the strongest man, fastest man, stuff like that. I'd like to see them bring that back as well as, as far as with the Pro Bowl game. So there will be some new competition involved. Dodgeball, which has been a fan favorite for the last couple of years. Precision passing, the best catch. There'll be a competition where you'll be able to hit off the tee, almost like top golf style, as well as kickers precision and accuracy challenge. So. A lot of new things. Spencer, does any, do any of these really you know, pique your interest at all? Uh, n not really. I do like the kicking one. Kickers are people too, but I mean, it's like the NBA. You have the three-point contest, the dunk contest, all contests that rely and go with basketball. I don't mind the long drive golf. I don't mind the dodgeball, but it just doesn't fit with the NFL. It just, I, I know there's supposed to be mini games, but I'm just not a fan of watching football players go out and dodge. Well, yeah, some people might find it fun, but I'm just – I don't, I don't really know how to feel about there being golf and dodgeball and all these things that really don't relate to the NFL. Well, and it's also taking part at the same time frame as the NHL All-Star Game. Do you think, for both of you guys, what's your prediction? Do you think more people will watch the Pro Bowl skills competition and the flag football game or the NHL skills competition in three-on-three? Three? I think they'll, they'll definitely, I think more people will watch the NFL game because, I mean, football is the number one sport in America. So I think more, more people will tune in and, uh, NHL, as far as right now, I mean, it's not, as far as the four major sports, it's not up there with the NFL. That's number one. That's going to be like that for a long time. So I think the NFL will definitely win that battle. What would you rather watch? I'd rather watch the uh, Pro Bowl. I'm interested. I'm intrigued to see what this uh, skills challenge is going to be about. I want to see this 7-on-7 seven -seven flag football game with all these different superior athletes. Yeah, and, I, and I, going along with what Brown, uh, Brown said, uh, I'm agreeing with that because, and I, and I think it's only because 
only because they're switching to flag football. I think if they kept the tackle, I think 100% easier. More people are going to tune into that NHL All-Star game. But I think just solely because they're changing to flag football, they're going to try something new. I mean, there was a huge change in the NBA not too long ago. A lot more people started tuning in then. I think going to flag football is going to change a lot of things. And I think a lot more people are going to tune in just to see how that goes for the first time. Well, also, is it the harsh reality of football that people love the best world-class athletes on the planet hitting each other and running into each other and scoring touchdowns and just the finesse that comes with football at the same time, which will not be there in flag football. Right, people love that, but I think, and like I love watching that. I love seeing big hits. I mean, I, my roommate and I watched the like biggest hit compilation last night. Like we people love seeing the big hits, but the problem is in these Pro Bowl games, players don't want to do that because oh, I go into a Pro Bowl Pro Bowl game. That means let me tell you absolutely nothing to a player's career, and you tear your ACL and then you're out for maybe all of next year. I, I just don't. I, I like the change in that way. I love seeing hits and stuff, but I'm just no one in the professional minds. Like no, Joe Burrow, all these guys, they don't want to get tackled. They don't want to risk getting an injury and then have them have to sit out for next year's season. Back in the day, like when Sean Taylor hit Brian Mormon in uh, I think it was 2006, 2007 Pro Bowl. I love seeing stuff like that. But the harsh truth is, you know, you're not going to see that all the time with these guys. They're trying to protect each other and keep each other safe. When we return, we switch to the hardwood and college basketball as conference championships only about a month away, creeping up as we head into February. So stay tuned for college basketball coverage on Plead Your Case. Have you ever been to the Everly Library? If not, you should, because it's great. They have books of all different genres, history, biography, fiction. Try The Evolution of Life, Life of Pi, or Jurassic Park. So what if books aren't your thing? Try movies like Frozen, or TV shows like Lost. Books and DVDs aren't the only thing, though. Take a trip to the second floor. Welcome to the Writing Center. These tutors will tell you everything you need to know about writing a paper, and the help your your essays. Now let's head back down. Behold, the Knox Learning Center. Need to print something out five minutes before your next class because you procrastinated? No problem. You can also print off pictures of dogs. Because, well, you can. So grab your homework, laptop, and textbook and study diligently. Bring your lunch, too. Actually, you can't. That's illegal. Now you know the Everly Library. Stop by any time. Seriously, it's open all week. The Purdue Boilermakers have dominated the college basketball landscape as the number one team in the country at 27 and one overall, led by seven foot four, yes, seven foot four center, Zach Eady. So Ron, Purdue is just absolutely torn through the Big Ten. One total loss on the season overall. This is just a team at 21 and one, I should say rather, that with Eady averaging 22 points and 13 rebounds per game, how do you guard him? I mean, you don't really, I mean, they, uh... You know, how do you guard a 7-4 guy? It's just like, you can't. There's no, there's no answer for him. But as far as Purdue, I mean, I'm not really sold on them. That, to me, there really isn't like a clear-cut number one this year. There has been, um, you've, seen, you've seen in previous years, there's always been mainly clear-cut number one coming into this time of year. This is, you have the conference tournaments coming up in a couple of weeks, and you have the um, Big East, well, uh, shoot, well, the NCAA yeah. tournament obviously yeah. still in the headlines. Big East yeah. tournament is going to be pretty interesting as well this year. Yeah. But overall, Spencer, remember Taco Fall? I do. He is, Zach Eady is like Taco yeah. Fall height, but the skills of any, any post player that you could imagine in the last 20 years. Yeah, and um, here's where I'm about to disagree with Ron. Uh, Ron, excuse me. Uh, I think Purdue is arguably, they are the clear cut number one. They are an all around team. And then you have Zach Eady, this like Austin mentioned, the seven foot four center. And we've seen guys like this come through college basketball before. Bull Bull, Tago Fall. Those guys are skinnier. Zach Eady is seven four. He's got the muscle. He's got the drop step of Yao Ming and Shaq. This guy can do it all in the post. And that's why they're not going to be one of these teams who has Tago Fall. He, he's just your popular guy, the guy who's so tall and he can do some of it. But Zach Eady can do almost everything. He's not the greatest three point shooter, but you don't need to shoot threes when you're averaging 22 points almost all in the paint and you're grabbing 13 rebounds a game. Um, 
Purdue is going to be a tear in the March Madness tournament. It's going to be very hard to stop Zach Eady down the stretch, down low in the paint. And one of the starters for Purdue, probably the best Whippeal High School basketball player I've ever seen live, Ethan Morton. He started all 22 games. He went to Butler. He is not putting up big numbers on the stat sheet, but he plays fantastic defensively. Is one of those glue and grit type of players for Purdue with only one loss on the season. And overall, the top five, Purdue, Tennessee, Houston, who I definitely want to get into in just a little bit, Alabama and Arizona. Before we get into Tennessee, let's stick with the SEC and go to Alabama. Yeah, huge loss for Alabama over the weekend. They lost to about 20 to Oklahoma. And the Sooners really aren't that good of a basketball team. They have their times and where they come and go. But this is a game where Alabama should have went in and completely dominated. That is not what happened. I was sitting in Applebee's, and I was watching this game. And as soon as I uh, turned the game on back from a commercial, I first sat down, I saw the score. And let me tell you, my mind was blown. Alabama is a very good basketball team this year. There's no reason that you should be going out and losing to teams like the Sooners. I was just very shocked at the loss they had. Ron, do you think Alabama's starting to be exposed? I know it's only their third loss overall, and they've really you know, dominated the SEC as Purdue has in the Big Ten. But what do you think overall of Alabama's performance? Well, as far as the SEC, I mean, what really teams do you really think of besides Kentucky, really? And Kentucky is yeah. a bubble team this year. Yeah, so, I mean, the SEC is a football conference. You don't really think of SEC basketball. Alabama's had some years here and there, but as far as them – I don't think they're, um, I don't think, I wasn't sold on them at all. I think, I wasn't surprised that this happened. And I think this weekend in basketball, there was a lot of upsets. You had um, number two Alabama losing to Oklahoma, number four Tennessee losing to Texas, number five Kansas State losing to Florida, number seven Virginia losing to BC. So this is just, that was just a weird weekend. Overall though, you know, Purdue is fantastic. I think Houston might be the best team. Okay, 20 and two overall. Houston is third in all of college basketball in offensive rating and third in defensive rating. Marcus Sasser and Jamal Shedd are playing fantastic for Houston. They're built on defense, but also have the offensive capabilities led by Sasser with 16 points, where I saw it live and in person when Houston played in Pittsburgh in the second round of March Madness last year. They are just tough and can beat anybody. Yeah, that's the Houston's your typical team. You don't have any all stars like you. Purdue, you've got Zach Eady. Um, some schools have big guy. Like, Houston's just your all around team. They're going to play gritty. It's like a team of Patrick Beverly's. They're all going to play hard. They're all going to die for the ball. Houston last year, like you mentioned, they played real gritty in the tournament. They went almost all the way. I, I thought they were going to do it, but you have you know UNC and Kansas who were the ones who ended up sticking up to the top two. But I, I'm just not sold on Houston this year. They look good on paper. I don't know how they're going to perform in the tournaments. With that being said, I. I think they'll do good, but I'm not 100% sold on their play this year. Yeah, I think, you know, Houston is getting back to their roots, you know, back to those days of five slam a jam. Yes, with sir. Ha Hakeem Olajuwon, or well, at the time, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Clyde Drexler. And I'm sold on them. I think they're a great team. Uh, well, I think they're a good team. I shouldn't say great yet, but a good team. And, you know, playing with that physicality that they play with, I could see them making a run in the NCAA tournament. Ron, overall, who do you think is a sneaky team that nobody is talking about enough? Uh, even though they lost this weekend, I think Auburn uh, could definitely be a, still be a sneaky team. Um, you know, my team, the Pitt Panthers, hopefully you know, they'll get in there, but I don't see them making a deep run, but I could see them being a tough team because they play with so much aggressiveness and physicality like the – Pitt teams in the past of the Jamie Dixon days. Yeah, Pitt is third in the ACC right now, eight and three in the conference. A rematch against UNC on Wednesday in Chapel Hill. Pitt has beaten UNC, has beaten Virginia, defeated Wake Forest and Miami last week. And Pitt relied on an 11-0 run to beat Miami. It was 68 to 60 in the final two and a half minutes. And Pitt found a way to climb back and win it at home in front of a sold out crowd at the Peterson Event Center. First sold out crowd since 2019, Ron. Who is a sneaky team, Spencer, for you that you're keeping an eye on? As a Buckeye fan, it, it kills me to say this, but I love Penn State. They've been playing unbelievable this year. Their guard play has been some of the best in all of bas college basketball. Uh, I just, they're getting overlooked. And, and like a lot of teams in March Madness get overlooked. Um, I love Pitt. I do love the Buckeyes. They're not going to do too well. I don't even know if they'll, I, I'm sure they'll make the tournament for March Madness this year, but they're not going to do as well as they did last year. But look out for Penn State. The guard play for them has been unreal.
I think a Penn State and Pitt matchup, even if it's in Dayton for a first four game, I mean, that would just be music to everybody's ears. Right, Ron? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, yeah, because there hasn't been really been too much of a Keystone rivalry in basketball. It's mainly been a football thing. But I would love to see them play Penn State and beat Penn State, hopefully. And, you know, I would even like to see them, if they get in a tournament, play West Virginia in the tournament, if they get in there. Pitt and West Virginia played earlier this season at the Pete, and West Virginia ended up winning that game. Seems like a completely different Pitt team. Uh, also, North Carolina basketball. Have to talk about the Tar Heels. A little bit of a rough season. Six total losses. The consensus number one overall team coming into the season. Losing to Kansas. Blowing a 16-point lead in the national championship game. Hubert Davis in his second season trying to lead North Carolina back to the NCAA tournament and make another run. I don't know what to think of the Tar Heels right now. If Carolina is able to beat Pitt, I'll have a lot more confidence in USC. But R.J. Davis got poked in the eye against Syracuse. It looks like he's going to play against Pitt. I just don't feel great about Carolina, especially because of how Caleb Love's been playing and the spotty shooting that he has. Armando Baycott has just played so many minutes. They don't. St they play like two guys off the bench. Pup Johnson still hurt. Spencer just does not look great and promising for UNC. But then again. The Tar Heels coming in were, a not, were an eight seed last year. Yeah, it's just a very, very disappointing season. I think we all expected them to be number one. Like you said, they were the consensus number one. But, I mean, you have these guys who just aren't playing well. I mean, after last year watching them go through that tournament, they were the not underdog, but as the eight seed going down late in the stretch, they were the underdog. And now everyone thought they were going to be top this year. They're not even ranked, and you have guys like Baycott. You have guys like Caleb. Caleb Love was a monster in high school. R.J. Davis, who got poked in the eye, but still hasn't been playing too well this year. I'm just disappointed, and it's unfortunate because I was really rooting for them to have a comeback year and like you know a revenge tour type year for the March Madness tournament. But I just cannot see them getting past some of these top teams in the March Madness tournament this year. Yeah, I would say rough season is an understatement. You know, you started the season off as preseason number one, and now you're not even ranked come, like, time to start winning. So I think, you know, UNC has been a disappointment this year. You know, I think a lot of the blue, bu blue blood teams, none of them have been really that great over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, Duke replacing Coach K. I mean, think about all the coaching changes in the past couple of years. Roy Williams at Carolina, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke. And look at the ones that potentially could be coming soon, like Jim Beheim and at Syracuse, some of these legacy programs that have always been the top upper echelon of college basketball. Now seeing some change. We thank you for watching today's episode of Plead Your Case. For Ron Brown, Spencer Vitteri, and our producer, Logan Lepiscopo, I'm Austin Bechtold saying so long, and thank you for watching and pleading your case here with us on WCTV. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.